This is Daily Blast Live. We're talking about what you're talking about. Are you all ready for this? Mm -hmm. This is a <laughs> sham. No. No. Nope. Just stop. Get real. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to DBL. Hello. Hi. What's going on? Nothing big happening in the news lately. Good Lord. We want to get everyone's opinion on this. Donald Trump made his big announcement for Mar-a-Lago last night. As expected, he is running for president again in 2024. Take a look. In order to make America great and glorious again, I am tonight announcing my candidacy for president of the United States. The Washington establishment wants to silence us, but we will not let them do that. We will make America safe again. We will make America glorious again. And we will make America great again. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we're just diving right back in, aren't we? We're just diving right back in. Mm -hmm. oh, I so, feel like it's more of a puddle. I agree with you. So how did this announcement go down with the right-leaning media outlets? Well, this is hilarious. This is the cover of the New York Post, and this is the announcement in the blurb <laughs> at the bottom that reads, and I quote, Florida man makes announcement. Page Florida, 26. Man. Didn't even name him. This was the lead story on the Fox News website. It's all about Florida Governor Ron DeSantis getting a standing ovation during his speech to Republican governors. So DBL Nation, we want to hear from you. Do you want to see Donald Trump at the top of the Republican ticket for president in 2024? Yes or no? Go to dblvote.com to weigh in. <laughs> so let's talk about this. All right, I want to talk to you guys very quickly about the tone, the entire tone. Very, the first thing I noticed, very different than a normal Trump speech. Mm. Very low energy, very serious. He looked almost mad, not interested in sort of being there. The crowd was very quiet. People were trying to leave because it kept going and they weren't allowed to leave. The applause was like, mm. what are we thinking? Mm. He's as tired of himself as we are. I think so. <laughs> I think you hit it. I, 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 I think really... he's exhausted. You got to be. There's only so much energy that you can put to a lot. I mean, this felt like a tree falling in the forest. If there's no one around, did it really make a sound? Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> honestly, you're talking about a, what, a one hour speech that consisted of at least 20 pieces of misinformation. Let's say that misinformation was one minute long. So a third of his speech was just misinformation. Um, I'm going to give it half was misinformation and the rest was vibrato. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I think this is interesting, though, because when you look at the split, the divide within the Republican Party, it feels a little similar to the divide between Bernie Sanders and Biden mm. when we were having that conversation. Mm -hmm. You have people who are either going towards like, you know, we're looking to stop the madness. We want that sense of normalcy back. We tried it. It didn't work. This person is a lunatic. Mm -hmm. And now you're talking about DeSantis being put in the forefront by the same media groups that were really touting and making sure that that Trump's voice was amplified. So when we see that split, which was really problematic for the Democratic Party, we're seeing that again, in my opinion, the with the Republican Party. Interesting. What do you, interesting take on that. What's that? What do I you think, think it wasn't the same surprise announcement that he had in 2015. Like we were the looking staircase, at. The, there's the yeah, elevator. that was a big deal. And now everybody knows, like, okay. Like nobody, when Fox News gives up on you and New York Post gives up on you, it's kind of like a huge sign. Like you got to know when to fold it. You know, <laughs> Kenny Rogers' voice. I love that. So song. You, it's just like I. When I'm watching this, I'm looking at the polls, and again, the polls were wrong, but like he's not even the front runner anymore, so DeSantis is, and regardless of who you want to be leading you, um, he doesn't have any of that momentum from people that thought, oh, I was the unseen person, I'm the middle class person that he's talking about, just keeping it real. Like, you're not keeping it real, you've kept it racist, you caused a riot, like, you kept a lot of things in, out of order, and I think people just wanted like a very calm leader to try to go into this next 2024 election, and I think that 
he's trying to maybe match the tone of DeSantis. DeSantis doesn't have, happen to get too riled up, and like that's his actual competitor now. And he's you can tell because on Truth Social he's constantly uh, coming at his neck, like, and it's becoming a war, which is going to be interesting to watch. But also, I think that people are ready to move on, and I think it's actually high time that conservatives did criticize him because you know even Mike Pence described him in many ways he hadn't before after all the things that he did to him. So I think people are finally ready, and it's like thank God. Yeah. Well, a lot of people though on Twitter, Trump 2024. Let's see red. Trump already has my vote no matter what. I know people will fight me on supporting it, but I have reasons and instincts. He's my president, and I trust him. Let's see what our DBL Nation said. 84% uh, of you said no to having Trump at the top of the political ticket. Well, there are a lot of Republicans who have openly said Trump should stand down and let others run in the party, like Lindsey was saying. There are a number of names of Republicans who are likely to step up to challenge him. They include former VP Mike Pence, Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin, former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Do you think any of these rivals stand a chance against Trump? And will this end up splitting the Republican Party and sort of burning it all down? I think they all stand a chance. Um, you know, I, I know we talked about the school of thought that Democrats were, like some Democrats felt like having Trump as the Republican candidate would be beneficial to the party. Um, I, I don't feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, I not, honestly, I also am a person who feels like if you are really going to contest something, you should be contesting something to its fullest. And I don't think the cup is even half full in the Trump cup. Okay. Oh. Um, but Nikki Haley, I think, really would be the most viable choice, in my opinion. What do you think, Lynn? You know, I love Nikki Haley, but I don't think that she has the momentum that I would have thought she would have had by now, mm -hmm. um, being that people have been talking presidential run for about four years for her, and she's kind of been dodging the question. DeSantis really seems like the clear front runner in this case, and I, I just think it's going to be interesting because uh, a lot of people have feel certain ways about DeSantis based on his COVID response and a bunch of other things, but if he can step into the national spotlight and show himself as somebody who intends to reach across the aisle, since we have to bring the temperature down, it's so important, then perhaps he has an actual chance. I do think that if Trump is the candidate and the nominee, that Biden will beat him again. Interesting. I think it's, I think Trump is running solely because He's under so many criminal investigations, and it's his way out. Let's hear what y'all think. Write us on YouTube and the app. It's going to be exhausting. Coming up on DBL, our interview with comedian Margaret Cho. You don't want to miss her take on cancel culture. Plus, oh yeah, we're going there. Candace Cameron Bure wants to put the Christianity back in Christmas movies. Did she cross the line with her take on, quote, traditional marriages? That's coming up next. Stay tuned. So we didn't get a chance to talk about um, Ivanka, Trump, yes. and Jared, um, who have publicly stated that they will not be returning to Washington, D.C., regardless, and won't jump back into the political arena. That is not a shock to me. Not, and, not Neither yeah. to me. I will tell you, we have the quote here. I love my father. This is this morning on Ivanka Trump's Instagram stories. She says, I love my father very much. This time around, I am choosing to prioritize my young children and my private life. I do not plan to be involved in politics. Politics. Big, big loss well, for Donald not Trump. Not only that, but she put out her stories. It didn't even make the grid, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> like, it didn't even that make the grid. That is hilarious. That is so sad. That yeah, they, is uh, crazy. That's a big loss in terms of um, people not standing by. The only people I saw were Madison Cawthorn. I saw um, Roger Stone was in attendance. Well, of course. Yeah, and, um, but not a lot of not the crowd or rally that you kind of expected. I think, Lindsay, you might be right on. He's trying to match this more, like, I'm a serious politician tone. Like, I DeSantis. Also, I would also caution on people, like, underestimating I him agree. again. We did that, all right? And then he actually won the presidency. So, like, let's not act like he, he, he has definitely done a lot of damaging things to himself to ruin his presidential hopes in the future. But that doesn't mean count him out. There's still except a chance for, that I would say, agree with you, except for that national election, which is with the midterms. That temperature check really told us we might be able to somewhat see that we can count him out because no one showed up for him or his candidates. Well, you don't. But I agree with Trump you. Trump threw his hat in the ring many other times prior to actually becoming the nominee for Republican. So we were taking it as a joke as somebody who was covering it every time he did it. As a joke every time. So when he was the nominee, that was unbelievable. And when he was the president, that was Do you think the that RNC would let him be the nominee again? 
That's the Republican National Convention. Yeah. <laughs> That Michael Dean, what a cutie. <laughs> Welcome back. So I don't know if you heard this, but Candace Cameron Bure, or DJ Tanner from Full House, is getting some pushback for comments she made about her new partnership with the Great American Family Channel. In an interview with the Wall Street Journal, Candace said she wants to put, quote, Christianity back in Christmas movies. And when asked if the channel will tell any LGBTQ love stories like Hallmark does, she said, quote, I think that Great American Family will keep traditional marriage at the core. Jojo Siwa posted, honestly, I can't believe after everything that went down, she would not only create a movie with intention of excluding LGBTQIA+, excuse me, but then also talk about it in the press. This is rude and hurtful to a whole community of people. Now, this is interesting. Candace's Full House co-star, Jody Sweeten, commented on Jojo Siwa's post saying, you know I love you, with a red heart emoji. But Candace's daughter, Natasha, is defending her mom, posting the media is an absolutely vile space for negativity. And I applaud you every time for how you handle yourself with the utmost grace. Th yeah. Thoughts? Um, you know, faith-based faith programming, whether it's television shows or movies, um, it is is very valuable in this Absolutely. market. Absolutely, like there is no question about that, and there is going to be support. My my issue is anytime we talk about faith based anything, we are there is an exclusion of certain demographics. LGBTQIA plus always stands at the forefront of that. You can put Christ back in Christmas without excluding a whole demographic of people who also are fear, God-fearing, Christ-loving people. Observing Christmas, right. So it always blows my mind. Like when I first moved to Denver, I went to, my church home was an LGBTQIA plus church. It was 99% that demographic. I was happy to be a part of it. First of all, it was lit. Secondly, <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, I think that going to a church like that also gave us so many opportunities to open up the conversation and integrate them in faith. And I think that a lot of people are just ignorant to that experience. I agree. I, I agree with you. What do you think, Lindsay? I, I think that Erica said it great. Like, I don't think you need to bash any community of people just to get your point across. So if you went to that network because you want to do the shows that you're doing, then do the shows that you're doing. Why do you have to even, when someone asked you that question, even if you felt like it was a gotcha question, have an answer prepared because you know you left the Hallmark Channel with intention that you maybe didn't like the direction they were going. So how do you want to answer that and be in your most PG way if you want to maybe suppress your feelings that the whole world for the most part has moved past and you need to catch up with everyone else. Um, but there are still people that go to church religiously and and they're preaching things like you need to be a heterosexual in a heterosexual relationship and so that could be her experience but that doesn't mean that you need to express that if you don't want to get criticized otherwise go ahead and express it but also don't get mad and, and you and your daughter don't get mad when people say something to you yeah especially the kind and also don't wrap all christians all together that was also a, an enormous thing she just stepped in it she just shouldn't have said it and she really in my opinion stepped in it let us know what you think we'll be right back In most elections, voters are usually asked to decide a variety of initiatives like bond issues or changes to their local laws. But some social media users say counties in Illinois, Oregon, and California voted to secede from their state and form a new one. Is that true? Well, let's verify. Our sources are the U.S. Constitution, the National Constitution Center, California's Legislative Analyst Office, and ballot measures in Oregon, California, and Illinois. Article 4, Section 3 of the Constitution lays out a specific process to create new states that requires the consent of both the state legislature and Congress. Only four states have been created by splitting an existing state. Kentucky, Maine, and Vermont were formed after getting approval from their existing state legislature. West Virginia was established as a state during the Civil War, when Virginia no longer considered itself part of the Union. Not only did the counties that voted last week lack support from the state legislature, but the measures on those ballots were also just a directive for local leaders to look into the process. 
In the past, these votes have been largely symbolic, and there's no precedent of any voter-led initiative successfully splitting a state. So, no, some counties across the U.S. did not vote to secede from their state. Even if a state legislature did approve splitting a state, it's still not a foregone conclusion. In 1859, the California legislature voted to split itself north of Los Angeles, but Congress never acted on the proposal. With your Verify, I'm Brandon Lewis. Escape the cold yeah. with the luxury included vacation to Sandals Resort's newest location, Sandals Royal Curacao. Enter at dailyblastlive.com slash sandals for your chance to win. Welcome back. She's one of the best stand-up comedians of all time and no stranger when it comes to pushing the envelope. Margaret Cho joined us earlier to talk about cancel culture and comedy. Check this out. First of all, welcome back. And just as a, as a real, real deal, true stand-up, we know there's stand-ups and then there's stand-ups. You're a real one. I appreciate you and I appreciate you being so candid. So I want to ask you, uh, you know, Chappelle's getting a lot of pushback for his SNL monologue and people are saying that it was anti-Semitic. Do you think this backlash is warranted? Like, what do you think about all this? I think it's interesting that, like, you know, the way that um, comedy is really... Uh, you know, people are really looking to comedians to sort of like metabolize culture. And, um, you know, it's just, we, we're like looking to examine like what's going on and we're looking to comics. And so that's, I mean, I think it's a good sign in a sense, but also like, I don't agree. I don't agree with anti-Semitic views. I don't agree with a lot of things that get said, but maybe it's really like the idea of like comedy is being art and it's really just one person's opinion. So you can have the opinion that you agree with it or you don't agree, but it's, I don't know, like I think comics, uh, we're really um, stoners and we should not be listened to for real things. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I'd agree with that. I like that. I like it. Thanks for talking to us about this, because some people don't even want to go there. Right. But comedians are also under fire for jokes that they've made in the past. And I wouldn't even say comedians, maybe everybody in society. Do you fear any of your material could come back to bite you, you know, today from what you've said in the past? Well, I think that that's probably um, a good thing because now we're learning how to make society more equal. You know, we're learning to have um, equality in our language because language, it really affects a lot of the way that people treat different groups and different societies, different minorities, different majorities. It's a really, um, I think it's an interesting way to make society more fair and that you can be accountable for things that you've said in yesterday's society, in today's society. So I think it's just a way for us to right our wrongs. Right. And um, the thing about jokes is that jokes are really, they're a noble effort to make people happy. And whatever that looks like, we're just trying to have fun and um, create some joy in a very difficult world. So I don't know, like I think, you can be taken a task for things you have said, but it's also okay to apologize for those things and to keep on going. <laughs> Jokes are a noble effort to make people happy. That's great. That was I the best definition. Love yeah. that because actually I've watched you know so many comedians lately on television and there is a sadness that's underneath the the performance because people aren't appreciating that noble effort. So I really I, I really appreciate you saying that. But let's talk about your noble effort because you have a new comedy tour. It's called Fresh Off the Bloat. <laughs> so tell us, girl, what is the story behind that name? Well, it's really um, a commentary on this exciting uh, idea that we've gone from just sort of being immigrants to actually being very much in show business. So we never used to see Asian Americans on television or in movies, and now we're seeing so much more. So it's a celebration of diversity in not just comedy, but entertainment in general. So to me, it's a really exciting thing to be able to celebrate. 
So you'll be in season three of L Word Generation Q. So why has this LGBTQ theme drama been so successful? I feel like it's kind of a, a connection between what you were just explaining before. Well, it's all about visibility and it's all about um, showing our stories and the L Word, the first incarnation of the L word yeah. to me is so legendary. And so this new reboot is really exciting. Um, and it's great to be on it. I think that it's like very, um, I don't know, it's very, it, it's very fulfilling to be on shows that you're like a fan of too. So I've been able to do that a few times um, with Sex and the City and 30 Rock and now with this show. To me, it's really meaningful and really exciting. And I can only imagine how meaningful it is to be working with so many women, incredible right. women. What's the best part for you? Well, just to be able to hang out with my friends, you know, they used to come see me when the first incarnation was out um, whenever I would play shows in Vancouver, the entire cast of The L Word would come and it was just so exciting. And so this is like a great way to hang out with them and have a good time and remember all the things we got to do. I love it. Thank you so much, Margaret. We That's love amazing. you. DBL Nation, check out margaretshow.com for fresh off the bloat dates. We'll be right back. Congratulations, Thank Margaret. You. Today's Sandals Word of the Day is swim. Enter at dailyblastlive.com slash sandals for your chance to win a four-day, three-night escape for two to beautiful Curacao. If you were on Instagram or Twitter at all recently, there's a good chance you saw a graphic like this. It was shared over and over, including by several celebrities. It says Iran sentences 15,000 protesters to death and several of the posts warn of an impending mass execution. So is that true? Did Iran sentence 15,000 protesters to death? Let's verify. Our sources, United Nations Special Procedures, Iran Human Rights, and the Constitution of Iran. The posts mostly cite a Newsweek article with the headline, Iran protesters refuse to back down as 15,000 face execution. It claimed, quote, the country's parliament overwhelmingly voted in favor of the death penalty for protesters. Now, 15,000 is the estimated total number of protesters arrested in Iran in the weeks since citizens nationwide began taking to the streets to demand improvements to human rights and liberties. According to Iranian state media, hundreds of members of parliament signed a letter calling for arrested protesters to be harshly punished. But the letter doesn't mean they were all sentenced to death. First of all, the manner of punishment requested was not specified in that letter, only that it be, quote, a way that would serve as a good lesson in the shortest possible time. Second, and more importantly, Parliament does not hold criminal trials or issue sentences. The courts do. The letter was essentially a request to the courts. Now, we don't mean to downplay the potential impact of that request. A group of UN-affiliated human rights experts called the letter a, quote, blatant violation of the separation of powers. But it's not the same thing as the courts actually trying convicting and sentencing protesters. That is happening, though, and rather rapidly. The first known death sentence for a protester was reported this week, and many more have been charged with crimes that could also carry the death penalty. The group Iran Human Rights puts the number at at least 20. Both Iran Human Rights and the UN experts say these charges and trials can come without warning or due process. The UN experts say the threat of the death penalty is being used by Iran to try to discourage protesters who have continued to demonstrate anyway. So it is very much the case that any one of the 15,000 plus arrested protesters could be in danger of eventually receiving the death penalty. But they were not all already sentenced to death and the mass execution has not been ordered. Newsweek has since issued a correction on their article and several of the high profile posts have been deleted. With your Verify, I'm Casey Decker. Why does your tire pressure light always come on as soon as the temperatures take a dip? Let's connect the dots. AAA says the cold causes the air inside your tires to get denser, which means it takes up less space inside the tire. The conditions temporary though, since driving around will heat up the tire and the air will expand again. Still, experts say it's a good idea to check your tire pressure manually after the monitoring system goes off. Most of us don't check our tires as often as we're supposed to, and that light means your tires are at least 25% below optimum pressure. If you do top off your tires with air and the light stays on, experts say there could be a bigger issue at play. Everything from a broken sensor to a, a tiny hole in the tire 
could be causing issues. If the problem persists, then it's probably time to talk to a mechanic. And that is Connecting the Dots. Welcome back. We all love receiving jewelry. Mm hmm like for real and today we have some beautiful pieces from Stella Carmina they're gorgeous and the prices are mwah, chef's kiss check them out Steph I'm so excited for what you have for us today it's a little different oh Tori and DBL nation the holidays are just around the corner and it's time to start thinking about some special gifts for your special someone so today we have got some fantastic jewelry Yay! you are going to lose your minds this is so amazing so first up we've got the diamond muse one carat tw martini link tennis bracelet so this deal includes one diamond bracelet and we've got it available in white gold plated rose gold plated or yellow gold plated That's lovely. over sterling silver now this is timeless it's sophisticated and it features round diamonds in a prong setting wow. when these one carat diamond tennis bracelets were featured on t TV, they sold out in just a couple of hours. So today, these gorgeous bracelets are back just in time for the holidays. Stella Carmina does not do big jewelry markups like you see in the retail stores. They work directly with the vendor to get you the very best price on jewelry. And normally, and unsurprisingly, these are usually $499. Ooh. But we've got them, Tori, for $129.99. Brilliant. Saving 74%. These three shades, you can't go wrong. Aren't they beautiful? I love that kind of a classic look. Okay, we've also got the brilliant diamonds, one-tenth carat TW diamond halo stud earring. Ooh. So this deal includes one pair of halo stud earrings set in sterling silver, and they also come in this beautiful little gift box. How cute. That is darling. And again, Stella Carmina works directly with the vendor to negotiate the best prices, which means big savings for you at just $30. Whoa. Why not spoil yourself and your best friend? Oh. So these are unsurprisingly a customer favorite. You cannot get these earrings from Brilliant Diamonds anywhere else. Wow. So normally these earrings are $149. Right. But we've got them for just $29.99. Saving you 80%. Ooh, I love hearing These that. These are beautiful. I love diamonds on sale. Head on over to look at them at StellaCarmina.com. You can snag these amazing deals at the lowest prices. You can even visit StellaCarmina.com right on your smartphone. Steph, thank you so, so much. We'll be right back. Diamonds on sale? Hello. <laughs> I didn't mean to come in so aggressive. Um, you have a... Well, well, I just want... My mom's in town. You know she loves the show. So I have to bring her here this week. You guys will probably meet her. Um, but I'm going to take them out because she helped me out so much this past couple of days I've been out of town. Her and my dad watched Kinsley and brought my niece and she had a best friend in town. So I'm going to take them to the Gaylord Rockies. Yeah. Opening weekend. We're going to go to the Ice Spectacular and do a whole winter wonderland. <laughs>